Jackie uh, in bringing the word for us. Minister Jackie is going to deliver a powerful word, I believe, and I know that God is going to use her mightily this morning. Be blessed, Minister. God bless. Amen. Thank you so much, Bishop. Good morning, everyone. Um, I hope we're all doing well. Um, it's so good. It's always good, I think, to start off with testimonies. I'm not going to lie, though. I think the more testimonies we get, the more nervous I become. And I'm just sitting there like, I'm so nervous uh, when I'm going to start. But um, yeah, it's always good to hear people's testimonies and the breakthroughs that are happening in other people's lives. Um, it's definitely encouraging. So um, we're just going to learn together today. We're just, if you would just allow me to teach, I realize that I'm more of a, I think, I would say I'm, I'm more of a teacher, but I think that's because of my profession. So I teach more than I do anything else. So if you would allow me, I'd love to um, have this honor of teaching, not just you guys, but myself as well. Um, I think as always, Zoom can be a little bit nerve wracking, but I thought I'd stand up today. Tinashe has started a trend with people uh, preaching standing. I feel a little bit better standing than I am sitting down. So um, yeah, let's, let's go on this journey and see where it takes us. So when I started writing the sermon, I was I was thinking about um, what I enjoyed doing as a child, and as a child, I I enjoyed sewing. That's such a weird, I guess, hobby to have as a child, but I enjoyed sewing. I would sit on the veranda for absolute ages, um, making clothes for dolls. Barbie at the time used to make really tiny dolls that were about that big. Um, and I would constantly be asking people to buy them for me from the bus station, from if they were coming from town, I knew somebody would always be coming with a Barbie for me. Um, and I really liked that. But one thing I started doing was bringing my friends into it as well. So I had a group of friends and there's no fabric at home because at the time nobody really sort of, I guess, understood sort of my love for sewing. But what they did do was obviously there's always a needle at home so you can try and find it and kind of sneak it outside when you know you're not allowed to be doing that. But my friends and I would walk around and find fabric on the street. So we'd go foraging for fabric and come back with bags full of fabric. And then we'd sit on the veranda and between the three of us, we would share it out to each other. Oh, and then I'm gonna use this for a skirt and you're gonna use this for that. Um, and it felt so good to be able to do that. Our dolls were the most well-dressed dolls in the world. I don't care what anyone says, they had the best outfits. They could change 10 times a day and still never wear all of them. And it was, it was absolutely amazing. But I graduated from Barbies to, I guess, um, to kids. But before I graduated from Barbies to kids, I graduated from going foraging for fabric outside to actually cutting up my dad's shirts. Um, I mean, it already has buttons. So why start learning how to put on buttons when I can just cut his shirts? Um, I started learning how to, I guess, figuring out different ways to, to find fabric in the house. So I used my dad's shirts. Um, I would cut up my mom's um, bed sheets. I would cut up, I guess, her linen covers as well. I, I, I'm sure that for those people with no kids, they're just thinking, I don't want a child like Pastor Jackie. That's absolutely fine. I don't know if I would too. Um, but that's what I started doing. And I would get in trouble. Obviously, I got in trouble, but that never stopped me from doing it. If anything, I'd find other ways to, you know, like if you cut a corner of the fabric, you, I would tell myself my dad's not going to be able to tell if I cut the back or if I cut the bottom. But they were always able to tell. As much as I got in trouble, though, for most of the part, um, my gift was nurtured. And I was actually encouraged to do this. So I would get the dolls and I'll get the fabric. And so from dolls, I graduated to babies. And so the more people had babies, the more I'd like gifting them with, um, I guess, headbands and skirts, because those are always the easiest things to make. And so I enjoyed doing that. I enjoyed being that person for my friends as well. Graduated from babies to kids, adding kids to that as well. Again, that's a whole different challenge. Um, and then I realized that actually, I don't have to go to school um, to learn how to do this. I can learn on YouTube. Who knows the joys of YouTube? You can learn anything on there. And I learned on YouTube how to cut, how to make patterns, how to fit people, how to fit myself as well, because I was a gangly tall. Um, I mean, I've been this height. If anyone knows me, I'm quite tall. I'm five foot 11, close to six foot really. And I feel like I've been this height since I was 14 and it felt like I could never find anything that fits me. So I started learning different ways of doing different things. And I realized that it wasn't because there was demand for me to learn to do different things. I was demanding it of myself. Um, there was something in me that was just encouraging me, I guess, to go doing this. But anyway, long story short, I enjoy it. I still do it. And the title of my message today is Persistence is Key. And my key verse comes from Hebrews 10, verse 36. 
for you have need for endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Um, the joys of Zoom. So before I continue, I just need to plug in my laptop. So sorry, it's about to die. <laughs> Sorry about that. So Hebrews 10, 36, for you have need for endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. So as a child, it's not that I was going out of my way to say, I'm going to be persistent and I'm going to endure and I'm going to do all these things. If anything, I think I just enjoyed cutting fabric. Maybe that's what I enjoyed more than anything. And that's what I like to do. So persistence is described as the fact of continuing in an opinion or course of action in spite of difficulty or opposition. So I like to think of it as persistent, persistence, sorry, is doing something even when it feels too difficult. Persistence is saying yes, even when it feels like your environment should be encouraging you to say no. Persistence sometimes doesn't match up with logic and everything else that is happening around it but persistence is doing it despite all these things. I realize that persistence requires endurance, the ability to tolerate a difficult situation without giving way. It requires resilience, the ability to bounce back from any situation. I believe that persistence is not just a skill, but it is also a skill, um, a skill builder. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna spend some time um, sort of exploring some of the skills that we can we can uh, build using our own persistence as well. So 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18, it reads, always be joyful, never stop praying, be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ. So the key words on that are always, the key words are without stopping, never stopping, without ceasing. And it's all about doing it in all circumstances. This means that despite the environment, the surroundings, the setback, I'm still required to pray. Despite um, what people are saying, despite where I've moved to, what may be happening around me, I still have to be joyful, always without stopping in all circumstances as well. So when you think about this, it means that whatever is happening externally should never influence my time with God or my prayer life. In the good, I will pray without stopping. In the bad, I also have to pray without stopping. Even in indifference, how many where you find yourself in the situation where it's not that you don't like the situation, it's not that you like it, you just don't really have any sort of feelings about it. Even in that moment where it feels like your feelings are so far, far away from you, it says we are to be joyful and to pray without stopping. Some people may wonder, what am I praying for in the good? I've received everything. Um, so my birthday was last month. I'm still receiving gifts, by the way. If you want my address after this, just you know, send a message and I'll send my address and you can send your present. So during my birthday, I remember one of my friends asking me, Jackie, what do you want for your birthday? And all of a sudden, I just got to this place of like, I don't know what I want, you know? Like, it feels like everything I'm going to be asking for is going to be so much more expensive. I was like, oh, there's this sewing machine that I've been looking at that I really want, but the sewing machine is about 300 pounds. I'm not going out of my way to buy it for myself. Why should I expect someone else to do it for me? Um, it gets to that place where you all the things that you're wanting maybe are so big, or they're things that you don't really desire, but you're like, yeah, you know, when I grow up, I, I want to have, um, I don't know, I, I want to have a Range Rover Vela right? I want to have a big car, a big girl car. So it gets to that point where you think my life is so good. My life is so great right now. I don't have anything else to pray for. And I'm not saying that, by the way, because there's still things I'm praying for. If you want to know, I'll send you my prayer list. But there's still things that maybe you get to a place where some people have gotten to that place where life is good. There's no need for me to be praying. I've prayed for things to happen in my miracles have happened and I've testified about it. So that's it. We're all happy. We're all fine. But actually, I don't think we can ever get to that place. And if you find yourself at that place now where you're saying to yourself, I've, life is good, you know, I feel good. What else can I be praying for? I think that's a very dangerous space to be in because prayer 
is not just meant for me and my family. Prayer is not meant for me and my friends. Prayer is for the world. We already know the Great Commission. I don't need to go into that um, anymore, but we, we know that it's about encompassing others in that prayer as well. If you no longer have to pray for yourself or you feel you can't, you don't, you're not gonna pray for yourself anymore, cool? But there's other people that you can be praying for. We know that every single day we meet at 1 p.m. to pray for the sick. Mum consistently does that, um, constantly praying for people. Even when they come back with praise reports, we go back to God to say, God, thank you for what you have done. Just as um, people have testified here, have come in to say, this is a testimony of a breakthrough. Help me thank God for what God has done for me. That's still prayer. That's praising and praying to God in the good times. I think sometimes we look at prayer as this thing where it's almost like you're going to a cash machine, you put in your card and you wait to withdraw something from it, right? But actually, prayer is more of a two-way street than it is a one-way street. Prayer is about me communicating to God. Yes, making my requests known, because as a child, there's always going to be things that I want. But it's actually about knowing what does my father require of me? And for me to be able to know that, I need to be able to sit in the space and actually listen. So I need to build up a skill that reminds me that prayer is not just for me. Prayer is not just about me and my wants, my desires, the things that are happening around me, 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 me. But actually, what is God saying within that? Am I taking the time to communicate? Am I taking the time to listen? I don't know about you, but I don't like having conversations with people where I feel like you're speaking at me all the time. I have an opinion and I want to voice it, but I also have questions too. Why do you do something like that? It's not me trying to, you know, question your how you do things, but it's me trying to gain understanding. Are we taking the time to say, oh, but God, why are you calling me into this place? What are you saying about this space specifically? Or are we just so focused on the things um, that we're meant to be doing here? We don't want to be talking at God. We want to be talking with God. And there's a huge difference in that. Again, that's a skill that needs to be built. We don't stop um, talking to our parents when we've gotten everything that we want, just to simplify it. We don't stop talking to our parents when we've gotten everything that we want. Why? Because we have a relationship with them. We have built a relationship with them. We know how they love us. We know what they want to hear. We know when things are good. We know when things are bad. We go to them in all those circumstances. Why not try and do the same for God? Because God is Father and He's always welcome, uh, ready and welcoming us um, to come into there as well, into His throne room. So when we think about um, when we think about this sort of prayer that we're doing, sometimes just because you've prayed about it today doesn't mean it's instantly going to happen tomorrow, right? That's where endurance comes in. That's where persistence comes in. That's where pushing in comes in, right? That's where you see the name, the, the same name on the prayer list and we're praying for it every single day for a month. Not because God doesn't answer prayers, but because we are doing our part, right? I may not fully understand what God is doing, but I know that God works at a different time. So my job is to pray for others. My job is to pray for myself and listen to what God is saying. I'm going to let God be God because I don't think I, I can do God's job, honestly. And we're going to go into it in the next one. The second skill that uh, my persistent or our persistent should build is love. So love, you know, love is, is great. We hear about it all the time. You know, there's always love songs here. I was hanging out with my cousin um, yesterday. She's 13 and she was listening to sort of you know, the songs that she was listening to, it's like all about heartbreak and, you know, all these things. And, you know, Taylor Swift and Mario, all those people and Neo, they're always heartbroken. And I'm thinking to myself, you're 13. What are you listening to? Who hurt you? Um, and it was a funny conversation. But again, at 13, she's already associated the songs with the feeling of there's love there. But my question, but as I was listening to her talking about the songs and we're arguing about, it felt great to finally be at that space uh, or at that age, actually, to say to somebody, oh, what do you know about this song? Like my sister-in-law likes, uh, like, likes asking. It felt so good to be able to say that to somebody else. But in the back of my mind, I was really thinking to myself, but what do you know about this feeling? not because of her age, but because we've been exposed to it at such a surface level. There's nothing unconditional about that love that they're talking about in those songs. It feels like it's very conditional. You did this, so I'm doing this. You're doing this, so I'm gonna respond this way. You hurt me, so I hurt you. So it feels like it's very much a surface level type of love. 
it has conditions. You have to qualify for the love. You have to work for the love. You have to pay for the love. You have to buy the love. You have to be willing to be knocked down, walked all over and crushed in the spirit for you to, to accept that love. But actually, God talks about a different kind of love, right? An unconditional love. And this one's harder. Um, I mean, I think it's easy to like a person, you know? I can like a person well enough because when you like a person, you know, yeah, they could hurt you, but not really. Um, what they say could offend you, but not really. Doesn't necessarily affect your life, your life in any way. You can sort of, um, I guess, get up and move from that. You can shake it off. Maybe if we put it time-wise, maybe it hurts you for like, I don't know, for like a minute or two. But actually, if you love someone unconditionally, that means that there is nothing that person can do to lose your love. Absolutely nothing. They can call you every name under the sun. They could do whatever they want. And there is nothing they can do to lose that love. On the flip side, there is nothing they can do to earn that love either, right? How many of us have ever been in this space where you know someone, they love you, and they love you so well that you kind of sit back and you think to yourself, huh, I need to do something for this person. I need to, I need to buy them something, you know? What do you like to eat? What do you like to do? What do you enjoy? Because the way you're loving me, you love me so well. Like you are the type of person who knows when I need someone to pray with me. You know when I'm coming to complain. You know when to sit and allow me to sit in those feelings. You know when to comment on those feelings. You know when to sort of redirect my energy to something else. You know when to say something and when not to say something. You know how to speak in a way that I haven't learned how to speak. And you speak to me in ways that I never knew I needed someone to speak to me. How many of you have ever experienced that? Because it's such an overwhelming feeling to feel like there is nothing. And I mean nothing I can do as a person to earn what you're doing for me, the way you're loving me, the way you're praying for me, the way you're providing for me. And it's absolutely amazing. And so it's like when you, when you think about that and you think about love in that way, you start to realize that this love we hear about, this love that we're singing about all the time, it becomes such a lift service to the point that when we now come in and we're singing excess love, Jesus, you love me too much. And it's like, yeah, but like, do you understand what too much is? Because until you understand that you love me too much to the point where you're sat with your mouth open, you don't know what to do, you're, you're, just, you're just there. There's no other way to describe it. You're just there. Uh, because what else am I going to do? I can't do anything to earn your love. I can't do anything to lose your love. Once you get to that point with a person, imagine a God who created the whole world. Who gave, up, who gave up his only son? He's like, yeah, I love, you know, even before I knew, or even before my parents knew, my parents' parents knew that there was going to be a Jackie. God was like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to send my son to, um, to go and die for Jackie. I don't think I am a nice person all the time. I don't think I'm a kind person all the time. I don't think I'm a loving person all the time. Yet, in spite of all those things, God is like, Jesus, just, yeah, you're, um, this is your mission, basically. You, uh, you're going to, um, yeah, you're, there's a cross involved. There's some nails and there might be death involved too. You know, like before all that happens, it's going to be like weeping and carrying a cross and people spitting at you. And so, um, yeah, and you're going to die for them. Oh no, they, they definitely don't want that. Oh yeah, they, they don't appreciate it. No, 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 they're never going to say thank you. Oh yeah, no, they'll never understand it either but we're still gonna do it. How amazing is that? Once we get to that space, then we understand that this love that God is calling us for, this love that God is calling us towards, even before we're able to accept this love, I suppose, but this place of love, of being able to wrestle with things that someone else is going through, forget the things that I'm going through, but being able to wrestle with somebody else's 
struggles, with somebody else's depression, with somebody else's mental health, with somebody else's physical health, before I'm able to wrestle with things that are happening in their family, things that are happening in their community, that is love. I need to be able to put myself well and truly in the middle for that person so that when they're not able to pray, when they're not able to speak to God, I'm able to do that. Now, those things are easy. Praying for someone is easy. But think about it this way. When they are not able to get up from their bed and they need someone to come and give them a sponge bath, when they're not able to cook for their family, when they haven't cleaned their house in three months and, you know, even, even the rats have moved in and they're now wearing slippers because they're like, oh, it's a, it's a little bit dirty in here. Even when it gets that bad, you being able to pick up everything you uh, from your own house to go to that person's house and say, in this dirt, in this space of chaos, in the middle of your tears and the parts that have been sitting in the sink for months because you've been in this depression, you've been in this dark space. I want to be here. I want to clean for you. Not because I'm trying to get you out of your depression. I might not be able to do that. I don't know how to do that. But because I understand that for me, when my space is clear, I feel a bit better. When my house is clean, I feel so much better. When there's no chaos around me, I feel so much better. I want to take away at least one burden from you. Let me come and clean your house. Let me come and clean your toilet. I know you haven't been able to leave your bed for months. I know that you are struggling in your house and your hair and everything is a mess. Let me come and sit in that space where things are dirty and do it on your behalf. Until I'm able to do that, I don't know what love is. I may say I understand it, but I haven't experienced it. I haven't experienced it for me to be able to give to somebody else. If I can deal with my own nonsense, if I can deal with my own, um, I guess, unbelief and madness and everything else that happens, then, then and truly then will I be able to go out and love someone else. And this is why I say that. So 1 Corinthians um, 13, 4 to 5 says, love is patient, love is kind. We all know this one. It does not envy, it does not boast. It is not proud, it does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered and it keeps no records of wrong. Now, I like to break this down and I was looking at it as this is what love is and this is what is not love. So if you look at it that way, 1 Corinthians 13, four to five says, this is what love is. What love is, is patience. Patience is love. Kindness is love. Being envious is not love. Being boastful is not love. Being proud, you know, some people are like, yeah, you know, I guess I just have so much pride. Ooh, well, don't we all? It's not love. It says that dishonoring others is not love. Self-seeking, being somebody who is self-seeking, again, that is not love. Being easily angered is not love. And holding a grudge is also not love. So what love is, is the ability to forgive, the ability to make peace, the ability to put other people above yourself, even if you know you're higher skilled than they are, sitting and listening and learning from them as well. The ability to humble yourself before other people. The ability to just remain in the background, right? That's what love is ultimately. And that's what it's saying in Corinthians. Ultimately, what this just says to me, love is persistent, right? Because these things, they require you to just have this mindset of, I really, really want to boast, but I can't because love does not boast. I really, really want to do this, but I cannot because love is this. Again, going back to the definition, persistence, doing something despite difficulty. It's very difficult to not clap for ourselves. It's very difficult to not toot our own horns, but actually, if we do that, it's not love. 100% unconditional, undefiled love is what is required of us. Sometimes we can work at it and be able to do it for other people. But when it comes to ourselves, it's a different story. How many of you have ever said the statement, I'm my own worst critic, you know, like, 
I just demand perfection in everything that I do, you know? I just, I can't sleep until something is done just right. Oh, I hate myself, you know? There's this thing that I do, I just hate it. I don't know. It's so easy to criticize ourselves and to put ourselves down and to knock ourselves down. And, and you know, sometimes you don't need the world to beat you up because nobody is beating yourself harder than you are. You know, you're just here punching yourself, slapping yourself. The words you're using are just, these are not words you would use on someone else. Why are you allowing your mind? Why are you allowing yourself? Why are you allowing them to take up residence in who you are to the point that you are in this space where you're so anxious all the time because of what you're saying to yourself. When I look at it, I think of love as an outward working of an inward discipline. So if I'm saying love is an outward working of an inward discipline, that means that I have to be disciplined within myself that when thoughts come in to say, no, Jackie, that was really stupid. No, actually, I'm not stupid. I may have made a silly decision, but I'm not a stupid person. It means that when thoughts crop up that I know are not true, I need to be able to let go of them. Because if I'm too harsh on myself, I can start to be too harsh on other people. That isn't love at all. If love is kind, what does that mean about self-criticism? We're told to love ourselves as we love other people. But if we can't even love ourselves properly, how am I meant to love other people? Because, you know, if, I feel like, I feel like if I was God, I don't know if I'd be able to put up with, with like humans. And by humans, I'm putting myself in this as well, because I just think to myself, you know, some of these things, it's so easy to look at, you know, the Israelites and be like, oh, but the Israelites. Um, and then, you know, thinking about, oh, the things that they do, they were so silly. Well, I mean, we're still doing it as well. So if I am able with all these things that are happening around me and I'm criticizing myself and all these things, if I'm not able to learn how to not contain it, because when you contain something, it means that you're putting it in something and holding it in. I don't want to do that. If I learn to set it free, just get rid of it, that kind of thinking about myself. If I can be patient with myself, even as I make stupid decisions, not because I'm a stupid person, but because the decision is stupid. If I can tolerate all the things that are within me, then I'm able to tolerate other people as well. If I'm able to love me, I'm able to love others. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. If I say that loving myself is constantly throwing up words at myself that are demeaning and putting me down, that means that I think it's acceptable for me to do the same for other people, which then falls into the categories of abuse and all these other things that we're not gonna go into. But again, that is not love. Being my own harshest critic isn't a badge of honor. It's actually a little band-aid that maybe hides the pain of comparison. Because if you think about it, what is it about me that I'm saying, I don't like this? It means that I've seen somebody else as well. I've seen someone else doing it better. In my head, I'm like, but if, if only I could do it like this person, you know, then it would be good. What is perfection? What am I holding as this is the standard and I need to reach the standard? Who is the standard that I am trying to aspire to be like? What is the standard for me? Because if I'm putting myself down and I'm criticizing myself, I've seen someone else and I'm saying, you're better at this than me. Therefore, I want to be like you. Don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with having role models. The issue becomes on when I now try to do it the exact same way that they're doing it. That becomes an issue. If I look at my mentor and I'm like, I want to be where they are, nothing wrong with that. But if I look at my mentor and I say, I want to breathe like them, I want to speak like them, I want to eat like them. If I do it any other way, I am not doing it right. Therefore, I am not a good person, I'm a bad person. Oh, why can't I never do it right? Why can't I ever get it perfect? Next thing you know, it's just this deep, dark space of just putting yourself down. And how are you able to hold yourself in that? And then I'm expected to then go out and love my community like I love myself. Please, I can't even love myself. You can't love yourself. How can you then turn around and come to me and say, but I love you. It all starts internally. 
so that we can show the outward working of all those things as well. So the scripture talks about um, love being given to us, but we already know, you know, Jesus died for us. Um, God sent his son to die for us and all these things. Now, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. I, I had to learn to love myself and say, yes, Jackie, you know, a good person, nothing wrong with you. Obviously, there's Psalm 139, you know what? You're fearfully and wonderfully made. I've never understood why guys don't use that verse because it was written by a guy, right? So it's like, honestly, all the men on the platform, every single morning, wake up, look yourself in the mirror and just say, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. That's a challenge. Let me know if you do it. Um, but I think that would be something that you can try. Try it anyway. But one verse that I've come to love is um, Song of Solomon 4.7. And it says, you are altogether beautiful, my darling. There is no flaw in you. You are altogether beautiful, my darling, and there is no flaw in you. Yes, Bishop Charles, yes, you are. And so it's that idea of, I look at myself because I, I realized that growing up, you know, when you move to the UK at a young age, you know, 11, 12, 13, you're starting high school, things are happening, you don't know what's happening. All of a sudden you're moving into this country where being black, especially in Bolton, you're like one of two people in the school, not in the classroom, in the school people. And all of a sudden it's like, I'm five foot 11. I don't know, never been, a, I've never sort of hunched to be shorter. I've always, um, but then I guess, cause everyone in my family is kind of tall. So, but still you stick out like a sore thumb and you start to think to yourself, oh, why is my hair not straighter? Why am I not shorter? Why am I not skinnier? Why am I not lighter? Why am I not darker? Why am I not? You start to think of all these things. And, you, and, and I think I didn't realize that how much I had taken on some of these things until I started to, to, to hear the speech or the things that I was saying to myself. And I thought to myself, the things that I'm saying to myself are not healthy, they're not good because very soon um, I have sisters, you know, two younger sisters who come after me. If I am imposing these standards of beauty on myself, what's stopping me one day from looking at my sister and going, oh, you've gone fat. Oh, you've gone skinny. Oh, you're looking darker. Oh, you're looking lighter. And all those things not being said in a positive way, but being said in a way of criticism because it's something that I'm feeling within myself. So I'm able, So then I'm now at a place where I'm now comfortable with hearing them in myself that it's now normal, this is normal, this is love, it's fine. That I'm now going and saying it to other people. So I had to learn to look at myself to say, do you know what? You are all together, all together beautiful, my darling. There is no flaw in you. Very uncomfortable to look yourself in the mirror and say that, but I learned how to do it and now I love doing it. And it always makes me laugh when I do it and there's other people around because it's always that funny look that you get from someone like, are you okay? Um, but again, it's appreciating that I will never be able to accept when somebody else is telling me something until I am able to accept when I am telling myself that very thing. So we've looked at sort of, I guess, loving others and we've looked at loving ourselves as well. We've touched on a bit of that. But the third part in that is knowing how to love God. I, you know, when I, when this thought came to me of knowing how to love, how do I know I love God? Or how do I show God that I love him? I really had to really sit down and think about it. Like, that's a very interesting question. How do you know you love a person? How do you know that this is a person and I love them? Um, how are you convinced in that? And I'm not talking about sort of, you know, in marriage, um, I'm talking and not even in sort of like, you know, your, your parents or your guardians, but thinking about your friends, where you get to a point of like, you love to yourself and you're like, ah, I actually love this person. Yeah, they annoy you and you think, they're so annoying, but I love this person. How do you know you love God? And how do you know you are showing God that you love him? Not because God can't see into our hearts, not because of all these things, but how do you know you love God, right? That this is the thing, yeah, I love you, God. Or is it a thing of, if you say it long enough, you'll start to believe it at some point, you know, like you constantly say, I love God, I love you, God, God, I love you. You're just saying it every single day until your mind is like, yes, 
I love you, God? Is it something that starts internally where it's like, I love God. And then you surprise yourself one day with, I love you, God. Oh, wow. That's very weird. I do love you, God. Everybody has different experiences, right? So it's about learning myself to understand. How do I know I love God? Do I even understand what that is? So we've defined what love is and what love isn't. Now it's making sure we're taking that love and putting it out and making sure that it is working. And for me, it came down to one thing. I have to know who God is. I can't just love someone you don't know. Can't just look at a stranger on the street and be like, I love you, right? The love that you maybe you can have for them, it's not going to be unconditional because let's be honest, you, you don't know who the person is. They're just walking, you know, walk past like, I love this person. We're told to love God and to love people. And I think we can love people in terms of, I love my brother in Christ. I want to pray for you. I hope you come to know God. I'm talking about that love, that sacrifice. I'm talking about loving God. You know, when you love God, you have to change your life. You know, like it's not a, it's not an easy kind of love. It's not a, you know, um, we're just outside, you know, playing house, you know, like we're just outside, you know, just walking up and down the street. You buy me sweets, you know, I love you. No, this is a love that requires you to change. You know what? Love God. God's love is so beautifully demanding. This is a love that will sometimes come and whisper to you and say, um, Sharon, yeah, great. You're in London. <laughs> Wonderful. I need you to go to Morocco. Um, there's, there's a few people there that I need you to go and see. Just, yeah. No, 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 not yet. Next year, like next week, I need you to um, just go to Morocco. That's the kind of love we're talking about. The kind of love that says, oh, that person hurts you. Yeah, you have to forgive them. Oh, yeah, that's what they did. Oh, that's mean. That's really rough. Yeah, you're, you're still going to need to forgive them. Oh, if anything as well, you need to like pray for them too because, you know, they're really struggling. <laughs> Just, yeah. Uh, that love is so demanding. How can you love someone like that if you don't know who they are because it can feel like yeah this person's so demanding like god is so demanding he's always asking me to do things he wants me to move countries he wants me to change jobs he wants me to talk to him first before um doing other things like why do i have to consult him first i know my own mind i'm a strong independent black woman i don't need to do that well well but if you reframe it and you get to know who God is. Who is God? What does God do? What's God's character? Is it that he's demanding? Or is he the kind of God who sees everything that is happening around the world? And he's a God who loves me so well. He sees my strength. He knows that Sharon can talk to people. He knows that Sharon can fit into any environment. And because I know that Sharon's strength, God says, Sharon, go to Morocco because this person will benefit from you. Not from Jackie, but benefit from you. Is it demanding or is he someone who is able to know the intricacies? You know, I may not feel like I have that skill, but God has already seen it. He's already seen that seed planted. He's already seen that seed being watered and it's sprouting and it's shooting up. I may not see it yet. And God is like, oh, would you look at that harvest? Look at that. We're going to eat good. And you're looking at, you're looking at your field like where? Because all I see is just brown, you know, soil everywhere. And God is like, right there. So you're going to go now and pick up your baskets and you're going to go and harvest and you're thinking to yourself, is, is he crazy? Like, I, don't, I don't understand. So it becomes this question of, do you fully understand God's character? Do you fully understand who God is? Or is this, are we working from this place of human interaction that we've seen, the human love we've seen, the love songs we've heard, and we're thinking, oh, he's just demanding. Once I started to, to, to reframe it in that way of saying, God is father. And God is love. God is a sacrificer, right? God is a giver. God is a nurturer. But like any other parent, God would be like, ah, that's wrong. Don't do that, right? That's who God is. God, he knows me. Even things I don't know about myself, God already knows. God is never, ever surprised by anything I do. God is never, ever surprised by anything we do, anything we say, anything we get involved in, anything we say, I don't want to do that. 
God is never, ever surprised by any single thing that I do, ever. There'll be times where we're praying and I'm like, God, I'm so disappointed in you. And it's like, ah, <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. I come back afterwards feeling bad because I realize that I'm not disappointed in God. I'm disappointed in myself for not listening to what God was saying in the first place. But because I can't deal with my own big emotions, I would rather go back to my father and put the blame on him than take the blame for myself so that I can work on those emotions so I can listen better, so I can love better, so that I can stop doing what I'm doing and actually listen to what God is saying and do it the first time. But instead, I'm just disappointed in you, God, because you said you would do this, but then you haven't done it. But the goodness of God, the faith of God, who God is, he is never, ever surprised by anything I throw at him. He's never, ever surprised by that. So once I knew that ultimately I may never understand this grace and it constantly overwhelms me, I realized that the reason I love God is because I don't know what else to do. I just don't know what else to do. I'm so resigned. I'm so in awe. I'm so amazed by this God who just wants to be so involved in my life. This God who is constantly a listening ear. This God who's constantly ready to speak to me. This God who's constantly ready to correct me. Who's ready to spend time with me in silence. Who's able to spend time with me. Who wants to hear the good, the bad, the indifference. I am in awe. And that's why I love him. And that's what it boiled down to. And so for me, it was about seeking his kingdom. And we all know Luke 12, 31. It's about seeking his kingdom. It's about seeking the face of God. It's about seeking who he is before I can try to find out what he is to me. Before I can find out what he wants to do through me. Before I can find out what he wants to do with that person that he has sent me to. Before I can find out how we as a community can impact and make God known. That's what it came down to. My mind is constantly blown by that. So I think we think about it in terms of we have been taught to love God and to love people. And I think there's a reason for that. Loving God requires me to know who God is. And I love him for who he is. Loving people requires me to know who God is. Me to love God. To love myself. <laughs> to know what God is doing. You know, in my life or through me. And then I'm able to go and love people. If I try loving people first and loving God second, I'm constantly going to be thinking to myself, ah, God, I don't know. These apples of your eyes, they're just bothersome. But if I love God first and understand the grace and the tolerance that he has towards me, I'm able to extend it to other people. It may take, you know, me just, uh, you know, <laughs> maybe sometimes just sitting there like, I'm going to love them so hard. I'm going to love them well. Oh, they drive me insane, but I'm going to love them. It might require me to like have a little cheer, pet talk beforehand, whatever it may be. But because God has loved me so well, why wouldn't I want someone else to experience just a tiny part of that? Because that's all that I can provide. Just a small, small part of that. Why wouldn't I want that? Persistence is defined as continuing in a course or course of actions, despite difficulty. My question is, what is your difficulty? What's your difficulty? Can I put it across to you that some difficulties do not need persistence. Some difficulties don't need persistence. Some difficulties just need us to get over ourselves. How many of us know that we can be persistent in the wrong things? Now, before you say Jackie's being mean, Joseph's brothers saw him as a difficulty. Do you think they didn't think to themselves, come on, be persistent? 
Well, they probably didn't think, come on, be persistent. Okay, that's a stretch. But they saw him as a difficulty. They saw him as something that needed to be overcome. What about David? He saw Bathsheba's husband as a difficulty. He ran with a big old difficulty. It was a challenge. He was, he was a barrier to stopping him from living his good life with Bathsheba. So my question is, what is your difficulty? Is it difficulty or is it jealousy? Is it difficulty or is it comparison? Do I need to overcome it or do I just need to get over myself? Know what your difficulty is. Sit down and think about it. What is my difficulty? Really know what it is. Do I need to rebuke the situation? Oh, do I need to rebuke my feelings? Do I need to pray against the situation? Or do I need to pray for a renewed mind? Because if I see it as difficulty, I will constantly persevere. I will constantly think to myself, I need to overcome this. And I can be focusing on the wrong things. I can be pressing on towards the mark of the wrong thing. So we think about a renewed mind. If you're like me, where sometimes it's not that, you know, you need to be persistent, you know, you need to be continuing on a course because there's a difficulty. If it's just a simple fact of you need a renewed mind, Romans 12 is there to help. So Romans 12, 2 says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. He's good, pleasing, and perfect will. I think if I'm too busy focusing on what other people are doing, then I won't know what God's will is for me. So I need to renew my mind. I need to renew my thinking. It's so easy sometimes, well, not easy. It's easy to identify external issues. It can feel like there's more solutions for external factors that are happening. And most of the time it is external things that we need to deal with. But there are times when it's actually internal and when it's internal, we try to find a scapegoat. We try to find someone else to deal with it instead. But what if you were brave enough to, you know, take the bull by the horns? Uh, what if you were brave enough to really look at it and say, it's not an issue of I need to rebuke the enemy. It's not an issue of I need to rebuke the situation, the environment. It's an issue of I need to talk to the environment that I've created within myself. I need to renew my thinking. I may have a solution for that. So I found out about a Polish neuroscientist and he coined the term neuroplasticity. He said that there's actually a way for you to teach your brain to start doing new things. So your brain, you know, when you do certain things over and over and over again, it carves out a pathway. And so it's easier and easier and easier for it to do that thing, right? How many know it takes two weeks to build a habit? And then after that, it's firing in that way. But actually, now you know that this is not a difficulty. This, I need to change it because this is negative thinking. This is poor time management. This is all to do with me. This is, you know, me beating myself down. This is me not understanding who God is because I've not spent enough time with him. Well, I have spent enough time with him, but I grew up in a church that taught me to fear God rather than to love God. Not to, you know, when I say fear, not in reverence, but to be scared of him because it feels like God is just waiting for me to make a mistake. And then he's just going to get rid of me. I need to change this so I can start doing this. And so he says that your brain is like plasticine or, you know, children have Play-Doh where you're able to mold it, where you're able to change it where you're able to do all these things, you know? And he says, your brain is similar to that. Imagine a field of grass. You know, um, I was walking to my auntie's house yesterday and I, I'm following the sat nav and I get to a point where I look across and there's a field and I see that, you know, there's a little path 
that's been created in the middle of the football field. That's not a path where the original designer had put in a path. The original designer says, Jackie, follow the tom tom, follow the sat nav. It says, go straight and then turn left. But those, that little footpath there says, or oh, if you want a shortcut, just turn here. And what that means is the grass has yielded and the grass has just died. And so people have formed a path. The more people that walk on it, the more the path becomes, you know, it becomes visible. It's now a path that everyone is taking to the point that even the, even the sat nav will be like, oh, you know, you don't have to go this way because this is the way the cars go. You go this way. Same way, if people stop walking on that field, the grass will come up again. It'll take it a minute or two. The grass will come up again. It will flourish. It will have life again. And it will be raised as if there wasn't a path on there as well. That's what will happen. Imagine that's your brain. That's how God created our brain. The renewal of the mind, right? The grass will die because people have walked on it. And it will yield to people. It will yield to those footprints. Renewal of the mind. But when people stop walking on it and the grass comes up again, because no one is trampling on it, renewal of the mind your brain can form these new pathways you know sometimes you can be like oh children's minds are like a sponge they absorb everything believe it or not all our minds are like a sponge they can absorb everything right it's just about persistence it's about endurance it's about consistency it's about saying i want to learn a new skill and so i'm going to try and do it a little bit differently if i teach myself that in the morning before i even get out of the bed i'm going to say the lord's prayer that's what I'll do. My brain will get used to that. If I teach myself that every single Friday I'm fasting, your brain will know, hey, we're not eating today. If I teach myself that I will never be better than this person, your brain will know that too. If you persistently do something, if you persevere in something, if you constantly do something, your brain will learn to do it, it will grasp it and it will hold on to it and it will learn to do it. I don't know whether that's a warning or an encouragement. It depends on how you look at it for yourself. So thinking about Romans 12 too, the renewal of the mind, thinking about neuroplasticity. The question then is, what do I need to do? What do I need to, to, to refrain? When I was making the doll's clothes in my auntie's veranda, I wasn't concerned about what other people's dolls were wearing. Like, it was never a thing. It was about how can I sneak my dad's shirt onto the veranda? How can I sneak my mom's bed sheet? You know, the favorite ones, by the way. How can I sneak them onto the veranda without anyone seeing me? And so I can cut it in a space where she will not see. So that when she sees washing it, they will not know that it was me who did. Obviously, they're going to know, but, you know, being a child. I wasn't trying to, to learn to do these things. I wasn't focused on what someone else's door is wearing. I wasn't focused on what someone else is, is doing. I wasn't focused on what's the biggest design out there that's going to attract more people and it's going to attract other people to want to come and do it. What's the, what's the big thing? I was just focused on, can I make this stitch? Oh, I've cut it that way. Will my door fit? Will I be able to do it? As I got bigger, comparison started to come into the mix. I shifted my focus on, I like this. Will I be able to do it too? I like this. Will I be able to, will other people like it? Will they wear it? Will this particular person, in fact, buy it? If they don't buy it, then this was stupid because I'm stupid and I'm making stupid designs. But I had to learn that it's not about that. I had to learn where my skill lies. And my skill lies in designing people, not making clothes. I can make a few things here and there, but you know, I'm not, um, I'm not the most experienced dressmaker. And I had to be okay with that. With that in mind, I was like, God, what do I do with this vision you've given me, with this thing that I want to do? I want to make children's clothes, but I don't know how to do it. And God is like, yeah, but there's other people who know how to, uh, what are you trying to, there's other people who know how to do it. It's not about saying I will sit in mediocrity. It's not about saying I won't learn a new skill. It's about saying I have learned as much as I can. At this point, 
I know that I can't make clothes, but I'm in a place now where people are buying these clothes. I can't keep selling them things that are held together and glued with, with a hot gun. <laughs> things that are going to fall apart. So why not bless somebody else instead? There's somebody who's looking for a job. There's somebody who wants to be able to do this. Why not show my love for God's people by saying, I don't have a gift in this, but you have a gift in this. Why not humble myself and say, please, <laughs> I'd like to hire you for you to be able to make this rather than kill myself with comparison. Why not think, this is where my skill is, God. This is where you have called me. This is what I would do. This is my path. This is where I'm going. I want to do the things that you have called me to do. I want to renew my mind, to renew my thinking, so that I can see your will come through. So that I can see where you're calling me to. If I keep doing this hopscotch thing of my path, your path, my path, your path, oof, <laughs> going to be so tired. But I want to see God, and I want to see God's kingdom come that's what i want to see i want to love god well i want to love people well this last sunday of june as i finish i want to leave you with these thoughts where have i stopped trying and started accepting things to just happen to me what is it that i'm looking at as difficulty and what is god saying about it Finally, what am I committing to changing or learning with God's help? All these things ultimately require faith, which we didn't even touch on today. And just as one of my friends likes to say to me after all my meetings, sis, do you believe? It reminds me that it's not about my strength. It's not about my will. It's not about things that I can do. It's about what God is trying to do through me. It's about what God is saying to me. It's about what God wants. It's about God. It's about God. That's who it becomes about. So I ask you the same as you take time to just reflect on those things this week. Church, do you believe you can make that change? Amen. I'll pass it back to you, Bishop Charles.